And so this brings us to the end of the second week of our course in Understanding Contemporary Art. Uh, and what we did this week to recap an overview was to explore uh, some of the great artists of pop art. We began by doing a flyby introductory overview, looking at uh, some of the grand, some of the most, uh, the greatest artists of pop art, such as Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns. Um, and we looked at how essentially what the essence of pop art was, was to illuminate the iconotypes of capitalist consumer culture and to show uh, how these iconotypes were beginning to, let's say, you know, a Campbell's soup can or a Coke bottle or the, the symbol for Coke or the McDonald's arches, how these two-dimensional icons began to fill and replace the semiotic vacancies that Mark Rothko had shown in his art that were left behind as the absent ontological center at the heart of the West after the, the deconstruction of the great metaphysical archetypes and iconotypes of the Western tradition. What Derrida calls in his essay on structure, sign, and play in the discourse of the human sciences, the transcendental signifieds. Those were the great signified such as the self, as the cogito, or Cartesian phase space, or even the arconotypes of the Madonna, the crucifixion, the Last Supper, etc. With the absence and deconstruction of those iconotypes at the end of the metaphysical age, and modernist art is essentially uh, announces the end of the metaphysical age as it was articulated by Heidegger. Heidegger came up with this idea that the metaphysical age extends from Plato to Nietzsche, and he saw himself as at the tail end of it, or at least on the outside, shading off from metaphysics into a post-metaphysical philosophical commitment in his later works on Aragnus and so forth. Um, that period is the post-metaphysical age, and that create, it created a sort of sucking center at the heart, uh, a sort of series of empty vortices at the center of the Western tradition that Mark Rothko made a very brilliantly luminous in his works of art. And we have seen that the generation that followed him with the pop artists uh, was an attempt to fill those shallow niches and vacancies with these capitalist consumer icons to plug them in and turn them on, as it were, and light them up. It's a very shallow two-dimensional world. It lacks the depth that the metaphysical iconotypes of the metaphysical age had. And we moved on then to look at Andy Warhol as the grand exemplar of this tradition of illuminating these flattened two-dimensional iconotypes and avatars. The anthropological types are the celebrities. The imaginary significations are the corporate logos, the two-dimensional brand names of Levi's and Hershey and Coca-Cola and so forth on the one hand. And the celebrity as the kind of human two-dimensional equivalent of this as the avatar and anthropological type of this new world interior that fills the vacancy left behind by the saints, um, the various saints and gods and goddesses and so forth that had illuminated and lit up the metaphysical age. And so we saw how Andy Warhol was the great artist. Uh, he was the, the first great icon painter of the cult of the celebrity. And he was motivated by creating his own little, in his Death and Disaster series, a, a sort of death cult uh, with a little car crash cult and the death cult of the celebrity. His car crash paintings went on to inspire uh, J.G. Ballard's novel, Crash. And so we saw how all of that happened with Warhol. And then we looked at Paul Tech, and we saw that Paul Tech uh, was a compensatory artist, not exactly a pop artist, because Paul Tech was a spiritual artist who was interested in finding, taking the iconotypes, uh, the mythological iconotypes, cutting them free from the world's mythological traditions and deworlding them, then crossing them, splicing them, and hybridizing them to create strange new forms uh, that had a certain amount of depth to them. So he wanted to bring depth to what he perceived as the triviality and shallowness of the world of pop art. And in that respect, I think we can see a certain comparison to what Van Gogh did vis-a-vis -vis the Impressionists. Van Gogh brought, Van Gogh was from Holland, and he brought a Nordic Northern sensibility, uh, a sensitivity to the abyssal side of the world to Impressionist art. And that sensitivity to the spiritual world interior was compensatory in his artwork to the very wonderfully shallow, glib, and glittering surfaces of Impressionist art. In a similar way, Paul Tech was trying to do something vis-a-vis -vis pop art. He was trying to, to illuminate it uh, first with his Cult of the Dead and carving up the soma of the physical body, throwing chunks and bits of it around like he was dismantling Osiris, and then later coming along with the, the new signifiers, and the new hybridizations of his ziggurats and various arcs and pyramids and tombs where he's clearly working with the world's mythological imagery. And then we finished by looking at Jean-Michel Basquiat, who comes in at the tail end of this entire development uh, when uh, pop art is winding down and is, is in the 80s and its decadent period. Uh, Warhol is in his last phases and the art is winding down and becoming a commodity. Basquiat became one of the wealthiest artists alive and his art consisted in taking the 
outside world of the abandoned city wall with the graffiti on it as escape signifiers that had escaped and were running rampant, like Jenny Hulzer's uh, signifiers that she has cl climbing slowly across the facades of buildings in her art. Uh, so too, the signifiers of graffiti and the corporate ad logos and so forth have escaped from all apparatuses of semiotic capture. There are no apparatuses of, of semiotic capture or weren't then in the 80s to capture them. And so Basquiat folded that outside of the city wall into the interior world of the museum, of the New York museum world, brought the outside city wall, put it into the museum, lit up the world of these escaped uh, internal proletariat semiotics, the semiotics of the internal proletariat, you know, the, the, the disaffected street person, uh, the homeless person, the gang person, all of the semiotics of this internal proletariat not taken into account by the overcoating of the capitalist consumer culture of pop art was what Basquiat was sensitive to, the outsider, the peripheral one. And he folded it all up and put it onto the inside and brought it uh, a certain amount of completion. And then uh, in his collaboration with Warhol, was reduced to the status of an apprentice and then his later works were not as good as the earlier works, and he declined into an overdose of drugs and heroin and cocaine and so forth. And so that gives us a sense of the arc of pop art. And this also brings us to the conclusion of our analysis of the New York art world, which began, uh, which we started by looking at abstract expressionism and then went through pop art from Jackson Pollock down to Jean-Michel Basquiat. We've looked at some of the main exponents of the New York art world, which represents the shift um, into contemporary art from the modernism of Paris. Paris is no longer at the center of the art world during this period. It becomes the center of the philosophy world. Philosophy uh, lights up now in France in the 60s in a way that is absolutely extraordinary and absolutely dazzling. But at this time in New York City, uh, New York becomes the center of the art world for the, the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even onward into the 80s. Um, next, we'll begin to look at the German post-war development, which is the great rival to the New York uh, center as, and takes a lot of the power away from New York as a center. And really, I think what we'll see as we go along here is that for contemporary art, especially after it gets out of the New York phase, there really is no center anymore to contemporary art. No one city can claim to be its center, as we'll see. The centers are everywhere in London, uh, in in um, even in, to, to a certain extent in Paris and in marginalized places like Santa Fe or Flagstaff, uh, we can see contemporary art going on everywhere. So as we go along, we'll start to begin to see that it is a worldless art. It's an art without a center that is dispensed with the center periphery model that was central to the metaphysical age with all its age of anathematizing manifestos. That age is gone and now we're left with a centerless world in which the artist creates a world island and a microsphere that he takes, he or she takes with him or her wherever they go. And, and so contemporary art is an, is an art of exiled artists and sort of monks and castaways as it were, practicing wherever they find themselves, uh, these little sort of art worlds unto themselves. Um, and so we'll end there for the, the second week. You might think, I wanna add here before we wrap, that uh, a final assignment uh, for the end of this week might be for the student to think about two, two works of art from either Andy Warhol, Paul Tech, or um, Jean-Michel Basquiat, or maybe a Rauschenberg, or a Jasper Johns, uh, or a Claus Oldenburg. Take two works of art uh, and think about how they differ from each other, how they imply differences in different ontologies, and uh, compare and contrast them. That might be a good final assignment for the student interested in uh, thinking about uh, what we have gone through for the second week of understanding contemporary art.